to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina, and today is going to be a great conversation and a great day. I'm so honored to be here with Dr. Mario Garcia, who is a legend um, all over the state and, and country and academia, and we're, we have been blessed to have him at UCSB for, for decades, uh, teaching generations of students about history and Chicano history, and we're going to talk about a really special event coming up next week. And um, at first, though, before we get there, I just want to welcome you, Mario, Dr. Garcia, to the show. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you, Josh. I want to just start off with, uh, we're going to be talking about the sixth annual Sal Castro Memorial Conference. And this year, you know, here it is, this year, there's a special event, which is a symposium on your work, Dr. Garcia. And everything that you have been acknowledged for, everything you've contributed, and people are going to be talking about you. You've recently uh, retired, although you're still teaching a little bit, you know, so we're going to talk about that. Let's start off with this conference. And what what is it? Why is it important? What can people expect? What can you tell us about it? Well, it, it is the six actually biannual conference of uh, and uh, it's named after Sal Castro, who was that courageous leader who in 1968 uh, inspired the students to walk out of their East LA schools, segregated schools, inferior schools to try to demand changes. And so he's a legend, Sal Castro is a legend in Chicano history during the period of the Chicano movement of the 60s and 70s. So I, we, he died in 2013. And so we named it the conference after him, the conference that started a year earlier. So this is the sixth now with one year be, uh, off because of uh, COVID. Uh, and usually the conference is two days of different uh, scholars, historians primarily, uh, giving papers on the Chicano movement, although this year we expanded it to include civil rights struggles before the movement uh, and after the movement as well. Uh, but uh, the difference to this time around is because of my retirement, some of my colleagues wanted to uh, kind of celebrate my work and my legacy, so we reorganize the conference so that the first day will be the usual panels and people presenting papers. We have a special panel on recently published books on the Chicano movement, and then other panels that cover different areas of movement struggles or uh, other civil rights str struggles, as I said before, after the movement. But the second, and that's on February the 18th, which is Friday. The next day, Saturday, uh, on, on the 18th, will be the special symposium on my work and my legacy. So um, we'll have Chancellor Yang there introducing uh, or saying some welcoming remarks. We'll have Representative Salud Carbajal, who was a, is a former student of mine, also saying a few words. And then I'm going to give a presentation of why I write Chicano history. And uh, I basically say that, you know, it has been my passion for five decades or more. Uh, to rediscover, to excavate, to, uh, and to write the history of Mexicans in the United States. And so that uh, my presentation will go over some of the, uh, the ways that I've done it in the different periods. But I'll conclude by saying, you know, for me, it's a passion. I need to do it. It's not something that someone is asking me to do or I have to do it to get promotions. I do it because it's me. This is what, what, it, what I'm all about. And, uh, of doing my work and, and adding to our knowledge about the history of Mexican Americans and, and other Latinos in, in the United States. So uh, the special symposium will include also a special uh, film uh, that is being done through the auspices of the oral history program at UC Berkeley. Todd Holmes, the filmmaker, uh, did the special film and it'll include photographs of my uh, of my career of of my life actually, and uh, and then based on interview you know, the interviews that Todd did with me, I'll be the kind of a voiceover. I haven't seen the film yet, but uh, he does great work, so we're looking forward to it. And following that, uh, there'll be uh, several panels. One will be a panel on the work that I've done on leadership and civil rights, and uh, we'll have couple of people uh, addressing that. 
I will have a panel uh, on the work that I've done on Chicano Catholic history, which is something that I got into a bit later in my career, but uh, my work has helped to uh, discover that uh, connection between Catholicism and Chicanos in the United States. And then there'll be a panel on the work that I've done on oral history and testimonial. Uh, I've used oral history significantly throughout my career, and including writing full oral history texts. For example, my book on Sal Castro that I mentioned, after which the conference is named, I did his testimonial. We did about 50 hours of interviews over a period of some years. And then I wrote it in his, in his words, but I also did a lot of other research relating to his life, to the blowouts in 68. I interviewed some of the students who were involved in the school walkouts, and I interspersed their voices and also newspaper coverage of the events and so forth. So I've done that kind of work and uh, a couple of the panelists will address. And the last panel will be uh, some of my former graduate students will uh, share their reflections on the work uh, that, that we did together, my working with them and their going through their graduate or PhD programs or with some cases they were my teaching assistants in our large introduction to Chicano Studies class. So the day will cover all of these kinds of activities that are related to my work. But I wanted, uh, I told I, uh, my colleague, Professor Ralph Ambruster Sandoval, who organized this second day, that I didn't want to just be sitting there listening to all of this, like if I was listening to eulogies at my funeral. <laughs> and I said, no, let's make it interactive. So each of the panelists will also have some questions for me after they've made their presentations, for example, on the panel on leadership and civil rights, they'll, they'll ask me a, some questions about, well, whatever that, that relates to my work in that area. For example, again, my book on Sal Castro, my book on Bert Corona, my most recent book, which was on Father Luis Olivares and the Sanctuary Movement in Los Angeles. I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll ask a question or two about that. So it'll make it interactive and a little bit uh, more uh, uh, less formal, you know, I, and uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that that interchange. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it sounds like there's so much and it's going to be a really rich environment and panel discussions and speeches and just a really great opportunity for people to learn about you and Chicano history and looking at the the lineup is two days of really high level stuff with Chancellor yeah. Yang's going to be there and, you know, Ralph Armbruster Sandoval is going to be there, you know, talking. And so um, I wanted to just sort of, you know, give you an opportunity to talk about that. Uh, let's let's dive in, though, on the crux of what you do. I think we as a country are naive to our history to a large degree. Um, you know, obviously, that's a generalization. But a lot of us don't really know uh, history like we should. Uh, we might uh, learn a little bit. We might have some knowledge, and maybe it's recent history or it's very old history. And that's just true of of, of every type, right? Uh, so I'm wondering if you could talk about why you write about Chicano history and mm -hmm. why that's important and yeah. why it's important not just for Chicanos and Mexican-Americans and uh, members of the Latinx community to know, but it's really important for for everyone who wants to know about history to know about. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah. You know, Sal Castro always said, and it was one of his mantra, Chicano history is American history. Chicanos, Latinos are American history. And that's very, very true. But too many people don't seem to make that connection. I tell my students, for example, that uh, in, in my estimation, there are certain particular reasons why we need you know, Chicano Latino history. One, for example, is just the demographics. Uh, as you know, Latinos now represent a significant portion of the population of the United States. Some 20% of the US population are Latinos, of which people of Mexican extraction are the majority at about 60%. But uh, that means about 60 million people uh, in the United States are Latinos. They're, Latinos now represent, and they've represented now for over 20 years, the largest racialized, I guess, ethnic population exceeding the African-American population about, uh, some 20 years ago. So I tell my students, 
if for no other reason, just the demographics, we need to know what that population is all about. And, and, and I tell them in 2050, it's estimated that uh, one out of three Americans will be Latinos. But then I say, guess what? The future's already here in California. Latinos represent 40% of the state population, the largest ethnic group in, in, uh, in, the, in California, exceeding white Americans, uh, African Americans, Asian Americans. The future's already here in California. We need to know uh, uh, about the uh, background of, of Chicanos and Latinos. They're in our schools. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, in our politics. They're in our community. They're consumers. Um, if you're going to whatever area you're going to go into in, in terms of your career, you're going to be dealing with Latinos in one form or another. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be dealing with them and so forth. If you're a lawyer. So we need to know just demographically what this population is all about, what its history is about. People think, for example, well, aren't they the last of the immigrants? Are you kidding me? That Latinos, first of all, were here already before the uh, United States came into California, came into Texas and the Southwest, which they took over from Mexico in the U.S.-Mexico War of the 1840s. They took that, conquered it. And so the initial generation of Chicanos are a colonized population, which tells you something perhaps of why they've been lagging historically, economically, educationally, and so forth. If you're a conquered people, you're looked upon as an inferior people already. So demographically, we, we need, we need to, to know they, 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 they've had a long history. They're not the last of the immigrants. Mass immigration, for example, from Mexico began at the turn of the 20th century, and pretty much with the exception of the Great Depression has, has continued. Uh, and then secondly, I, I say, uh, we need to know it for uh, academic reasons. And by that, I mean is, how can we really understand the full nature of American history, of American culture, if we're not uh, integrated, or we're not uh, bringing in all the groups that have contributed to the history of the United States, especially in this case, Chicanos and Latinos, that we're not really understanding the full nature of, of our history. Let's say, for example, we talk about, well, um, how about the beginnings of American uh, literature, let's say, and and so people will say, well, you know, there's those documents and diaries and journals that in, uh, English colonists and others in the 13 colonies wrote and so forth. Okay, that's that's good enough. But what about even prior to the establishment of the 13 colonies, you have the Spanish entering into New Mexico, Texas, later California, and some of the, the people there, the missionaries, the, the military, they wrote documents, they wrote diaries, they wrote journals. Isn't that part of the origins of American literature as well? It's in Spanish, but, but it's still part of uh, a literary tradition that ultimately becomes part of the United States. So we need to begin to rethink and revise what we mean by American history. You know, we usually think of American history east to west, right? The movement to the west. Mm -hmm. Oh, what, if you include Chicanos and Latinos, now you've got a south to north. Uh, uh, projection. So we need to kind of rethink even that kind of idea that our history is east to west, it's south to north as well. And the last thing I tell my students is for uh, for for the, the issues of, of, of good citizenship. How can we be good citizens if we, again, don't know the full extent of our the history of this country? We don't know the history of a significant population that is only going to grow larger how can we be good citizens? Let's take the issue of immigration. How can we deal with and discuss coherently, uh, historically, the issue of immigration coming from the South, from Mexico, from Central America, if we didn't, don't know what that, that, that history is all about? I mean, uh, they're, they're coming because of conditions in their home countries, of, of course, poverty or other economic, political changes. But they're also coming because historically we've pulled them in. We've pulled them in. When that very first big immigration, massive immigration began in the early 20th century, yes, they were leaving because of economic conditions in Mexico and the Mexican Revolution of 1910, which forced a lot of them out. My own family on my mother's side came out of the Mexican Revolution. But, well, but they were also being pulled in because the Southwest in the early 20th century is integrated into the new industrial economy of the United States, not because the industries were being established, but because the Southwest becomes 
an area where they can find additional foodstuffs for the industrial armies of the, that are being assembled in the east and the west. And, it's, and then you also find finding industrial, uh, uh, in, in the mining area, uh, ores, industrial ores that are needed like copper and silver and lead. And then, and then, and then uh, the, the extension of the railroads, not so much building the railroads, but maintaining. Who was doing all that work? It was Mexican immigrant workers who were being pulled in and doing that. They, they built the economy of the Southwest in the early 20th century from Texas to California. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, they were treated, they were heavily exploited. They were hired in literally what we call Mexican jobs, mm. paid what we call Mexican wage. So Mexican immigrants have had a long, long history and have contributed to the economy of this country. So when we hear, you know, that nativist or uh, person, racist, whatever, saying, well, no, these people are just coming to take things away from us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, early on in my career, UCSB, I was asked to speak at a Kiwanis club in downtown uh, Santa Barbara about Mexican immigration. And I did, and gave them, you know, what I knew of the history. And in the Q&A, any questions? One gentleman finally raised his hand. He said, you know, I don't have anything against Mexican immigrants, except they come and impregnate our daughters. Oh, no. And I, how do I respond to that? I said, well, I said, I said something like, well, I guess you find unwanted pregnancies in, in all cultures. But this is the extent of what this guy was focused on. Right. Not the fact that immigrants in Mexico had been coming in in huge numbers already in the early 20th century and building the economy. Even here at Santa Barbara, they worked the the uh, agricultural areas here and so forth. They built, the, the they constructed the streets, they constructed the homes and so forth and so on. So that's what I mean by being, knowing the history of Chicanos Latinos in order to be a good citizen. Stop dealing with stereotypes, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, you go back, well, you know, we all know the, the Trump's famous uh, remark about immigrants, you know, they all come, they're criminals, they're rapists. Give me a break, you know. Uh, so people, in order to be good citizens, and including Chicanos, we need to know the history of this very, very important population. Oh yeah, that, that's great. It's it's so uh, so fortunate to get a little bit of a, a lecture here uh, and <laughs> the, the audience, and you know, to hear that history for free. Um, I wonder. I want to talk to you about the late '60s and things like the Chicano moratorium and the Vietnam War and the term Chicano. Uh, because there are people who, you know, we're in this era now where Latinx is a term, preferred term by by many. It's it's not preferred by others. It is a controversial term. But um, if somebody wants to be referred to as Latinx, uh, certainly in journalism, AP style, then you refer to them as that. You know, you refer to them how they want to be referred to. And uh, if they want to be called Chicano, then you refer to them as that, you know, um, but you have to ask them, you have to defer. And so we have all these terms and the Hispanic population, the Latino population is diverse, right? We're, we're different if we're from Mexico, if our parents are from Mexico or for, then from Puerto Rico or, you know, any of the Hispanic Latin American countries, we're all, we're all different. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if one, if you could just define the term Chicano. Right. And what that is for people who may think they can use it with any Mexican American mm -hmm. or anyone, what does that term mean? And then can so, you talk about the civil rights movement and the Chicano moratorium and the Vietnam War and, and, and how how when we talk about our history, well, who was dying in the Vietnam War, you know, in numbers that were not necessarily acknowledged? Can you talk about that period? Because yeah, when you think well, of the civil rights movement. There's certain images that come to mind, and I'm not sure that that um, Latinos and Hispanics do in most people's yeah. minds. There's a lot there, oh. <laughs> Josh. Uh, get, get me all on back on track if I, sure. if I uh, deviate. But uh, let's go to the term Chicano. The term Chicano, uh, from what we know, is first visible or first heard back in the 1920s. The Mexican anthropologist uh, uh, did some work on Mexican immigration, uh, discovered in his interviews, uh, Manuel Gamio, uh, that the term Chicano was used and it was linked to Mexican immigrant workers. And some people think that it's 
it's it's a variation of Mexicano, but perhaps pronounced with a kind of indigenous uh, uh, pronunciation, so that it comes out Chicano, mm -hmm. Chicano. So the term Chicano, from what we know, has a long history. We know that later in the 1940s, around World War II, the term Chicano, which is applicable to people of Mexican background, not to Puerto Ricans or Cuban Americans, it's very specific to people of Mexican descent, not that all of them use it, even in, in the 40s, for example, that I'm referring to right now. But there are uh, some young Mexican Americans in the early 40s who uh, express their alienation from both American culture, the problems they had with the schools, but even they're uncomfortable with their Mexican culture. Maybe they feel it's too strict and so forth and so on, and they want to explore their own particular culture. These become the so-called pachucos of the 1940s and even beyond. Uh, they're a countercultural group of young people in the bigger urban areas of the Southwest where most Mexicans in that period of time live. You know, they live everywhere, but still heavily concentrated in the Southwest from Texas, California. Um, in the big uh, LA, El Paso. In fact, some people think that the term Pachuco comes out of El Paso, which is my hometown. And so some people will say, we'll call El Paso El Chuco. But the Pachucos rediscovered the term Chicano and they apply it to themselves as a counter uh, cultural term, a kind of defiance against both Anglo culture and to some extent even from their parental Mexican culture. They just, they, they are creating their own counter culture. Their appearance, some of them wearing the zoot suit. They, they create their own language called Calo, C-A-L-O. Uh, and they have all kinds of words that seem to be nothing to do with Spanish or English. You know, it, it's their own language, it's a counter language. So the term Chicano has an evolution. So by the 1940s, it's used by US born Mexican Americans, but of, of, the, the, of the Pachuco extreme of the Mexican American population at that time. When I was growing up in the 1950s, uh, I, knew, I, heard the, I knew the term Chicano, I heard the term Chicano. In, in my Catholic high school, we had kids from the Southside Hardcore Radio of South El Paso. They called themselves Chicano, not with a political uh, connection, but with some ethnic pride. Mm -hmm. I'm Chicano, yo soy Chicano. So I, I knew it, I heard it. Of course, with the civil rights movement, as you mentioned, um, the so-called Chicano movement of the late 60s and early 70s, that generation, which is that, which my generation, also then rediscover the term Chicano. And hence the Chicano generation, the Chicano movement. And again, it is used as a term of defiance, but now the term is politicized. To be a Chicano during the period of the Chicano movement uh, is to be an activist of the movement. Chicano or Chicana. Uh, anyway, so uh, the, the, the Mexican Americans, Josh, have had a long history of civil rights struggle. And that's why the conference uh, this uh, week will acknowledge that it's not, civil rights history doesn't begin or end with the Chicano movement because there's a longer history of Mexican American civil rights struggles. And that's why we're, we opened it up to include people presenting uh, from this other, other periods. Mm -hmm. Let's take, for example, in. In the 1930s, many of the children of the immigrants who were coming in, in large numbers in the early 20th century come of age. They are U.S. born citizens, uh, although not really treated as full U.S. born citizens. So many of them began to uh, organize around the fact that as U.S. born Mexican Americans, they are not being given their full civil rights. They're not being acknowledged as full Americans. So by the 1930s, you have what I call the Mexican-American generation, which is a new leadership that arises. Uh, and, and they begin to organize in organizations, for example, like the League of United Latin American Citizens in Texas. Uh, it's interesting that they use the term Latin. And the reason for that, Josh, is because Texas being such a heavily racist state, 
the term Mexican already in the early 20th century with the immigrants coming in was heavily racialized. To be a Mexican was to be considered a member of a racially inferior population. And so LULAC members did not want to use the term Mexican because it would automatically bring a lot of uh, attention and possibly attacks on the group. So they used what they considered to be a more neutral term. Latin American, which is interesting because today we are using the term at least Latino. So maybe they were a little bit ahead of their times. But uh, LULAC is the first significant Mexican-American civil rights group, but many others will, will form uh, during the 30s and, uh, and during the four, uh, 40s. Probably the most prominent group after World War II uh, is the American GI Forum, composed of Mexican-American veterans who fought in World War II. But this early Mexican-American civil rights movement, Josh, will focus on what? They will focus on the historic, uh, on, the, on the issues of education. In the early 20th century, public schools throughout the Southwest, including here in Southern California, had segregated public schools for Mexican-Americans. They were called Mexican schools. They were inferior schools. They had lack of resources, uh, lack of grades, uh, in terms of how much you could go up uh, the, in terms of grades. Uh, and they, one of the worst, I call it a crime, uh, things about the Mexican schools is that you had too many teachers, most of them Anglo teachers, white Anglo teachers, and I'm not saying all of them, but too many who had low expectations of their kids. They would walk into a classroom of Mexican Americans and already uh, feel that these kids could not be challenged uh, to achieve uh, higher standards of education. So they taught at the lowest common denominator. And they said, well, you know, the IQ tests that began to be administered in the early 20th century show that these Mexican Americans are pretty dumb. You know, they don't, they seem to be mentally inferior. These are racist I IQ tests. So um, the civil rights movement led by groups like Lulek went to uh, struggle to, to desegregate those. And in 1946, there was a very important case here in Southern California, uh, so-called Mendes case in Orange County, uh, which uh, uh, Mexican-Americans uh, through the attorneys that they hired went to the federal courts to challenge the segregation of Mexican-American children. And uh, they succeeded in 1946 in, in the Mendes case. The federal court in Los Angeles ruled that there was no basis for the segregation of Mexican Americans. California had legislation that did mandate segregation for African Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans, but not Mexican Americans. So the federal court said that the uh, constitutional rights of the Mexican American children were being violated also on the basis of the 14th Amendment. Some have suggested that the Mendes case lays the foundation for the more famous Brown case in 1954. Yeah. But also discrimination in public facilities, Josh, uh, the, this early civil rights movement took on discriminate. There were, there were uh, restaurants in Texas that had signs like, um, no dogs or Mexicans allowed. Um, you had theaters that forced Mexican Americans throughout the Southwest to have to sit on the side aisles or in the balconies alongside with African Americans. There were swimming pools in Southern California, for example, public swimming pools where Mexican Americans and other minorities could only use the public swimming pool on one day. Mm. And the kicker here was it was a day that they cleaned the pool, dirty Mexican. So, and you, and uh, even here, close to Santa Barbara, uh, down in Carpinteria, at the end of Linden Avenue, you have beautiful beachfront, beautiful beaches. Up until the 1950s, Mexican Americans were not allowed to use that portion of the beach. They had to go further down or further up, but not in the main central where most of the Anglo-American, white American used to be. So there was this, there was discrimination in Texas on the juries where people were, were being uh, uh, indicted for certain crimes, including murder and so forth, Mexican-Americans, and were judged by an all-white jury. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, Mexican-Americans through LULAC, uh, 
and the July form, they challenged that. And in 1954, a month or so before the Brown case, the Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren ruled that the, the, uh, the, the exclusion of Mexican Americans in the jury system in Texas was unconstitutional based on the 14th Amendment. It, the court said any class of people who have suffered history of discrimination and therefore and then and not allowed to serve like on a jury system, that 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 is that is discrimination. And so these are the kinds of things that the early civil rights movement took on and very courageously. And so there's a longer history now that what the Chicano movement was less aware of this early history because the history hadn't been written. And mm. I, I've, I've written several books that deal with the Mexican-American generation. But, but at the time of the movement in the 60s and early 70s, the Chicano activists, they didn't know that that earlier generation had had a very strong civil rights movement. They thought they were the ones, the first ones. That, well, they weren't. But they did add to the history of the civil rights movement. And in fact, went beyond it because the Chicano movement, yes, was a civil rights movement to deal with still continuation of, of, of segregation, uh, inferiority in the schools, lack of political representation, discrimination in housing, discrimination in health, discrimination in the media, uh, and so forth and so on. It, it, some, some improvements have been made by the earlier generation, but there, there was still a lot of a lot of issues and problems here. The, the Chicano movement took it up a notch, more militant. They they were less, uh, they were less, uh, they have less of a belief that American institutions like the courts and the political system could bring about significant social change. The new Chicano generation uh, despaired of that. So they said the only way that we're going to bring about change is what they call direct action. What does that mean? Out in the streets, marches, demonstrations, boycotts, et cetera. And that's just it. that seemed to, to, to waken up a lot of institutions. And so the movement was more militant in that, in that sense. And, uh, but it's still heavily focused on still basic civil rights issues like the schools and, and political representation and uh, lack of economic uh, opportunities. And they were able to force a lot of these changes, not completely, because we still have a lot of uh, problems and discrimination and racism that affect the Mexican Latino communities. But they did show that, that Chicanos uh, were going to, uh, not afraid to take on, to take on the, the system, that they wanted to be change makers. That, those, that Mexican-American generation, that Chicano generation, took on that stereotype that too many Americans have of the sleepy, passive Mexican. These people, you know, they don't want to engage with politics. They just, you know, the passive. Well, hardly uh, the early, the Mexican-American generation took on the system. The Chicano generation took on the system in their own more militant way, mm -hmm. like the Brown Berets, all of that. <clears throat> now, Here's the problem, as I see it, Josh, and about the issue that we need to do in terms of rethinking American history. The period of the 60s, which actually spills into the 70s, it's a very rich history of protests, of civil rights movements by African Americans, the anti-war movement, the feminist movement. It's a very rich history of, of struggling, of people saying, no, we're not content with the way the system is, things have to change. But if you read the history of the 60s, also spills in the 70s, I said. What's missing? Among other things, the Chicano movement is missing. Historians who have written about this period, it's a, they don't even know that there was a Chicano movement, but there was a Chicano movement. And it's important to integrate it into, a, into that history of that, of that period so that we have a, a better idea of what these social protest movements, these social movements were all about in that period of time, the Chicano movement was a very, very rich, uh, it's a very rich history of these kinds of struggles. Now, you mentioned the anti-war movement. Part of, of, of recognizing the Chicano movement is to recognize that no other minority group, including African Americans, had such a strong and important anti-Vietnam War movement. 
of protest. Why? Well, you could refer to it. Who was doing the fighting? Who was being drafted in extraordinary numbers? People may or may not remember that in the 60s and 70s during the period of the US war in Vietnam, which was an, an, an unnecessary war, it was a war of choice by the United States. That was a civil war we were interfering with. We had no business there. Yet we lost 60,000 Americans and millions of Vietnamese on both sides. Uh, but who was doing the fighting? We had a draft. The only way that you could stay out of the draft was that you continued your education. So once you graduate from high school, for example, and you're 18 and you're eligible to be drafted, but if you went on to college, for example, as I did, you, 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 you had a, uh, a you, 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 you couldn't be drafted. Uh, and, but many Chicanos, because of the whole legacy of the Mexican schools and the inferiority of those schools, uh, many of them did not go on to college or were encouraged to go to college. And you had dropout rates in the East LA schools of up to 50% or more in the East LA high schools. And they were being pushed out because of the lack of sensitivity to their history, their culture, their language. Uh, and, and also the continuation of the sense that Chicanos, you know, were mentally inferior, they were, like I said earlier. That, and um, so many of them dropped out. As soon as they dropped out, if they became 18, Uncle Sam wants you. And they didn't go into college. Sal Castro says, uh, amazingly, at, at Lincoln High School, where he taught during the time of the walkouts in 68, he said, there were more military recruiters in our schools than there were college recruiters. What does that tell you? And so a lot of kids were drafted because they weren't encouraged to go to college. They, along with African-Americans and poor white Americans, became, became the cannon fodder for the war in Vietnam. They were the ones that were out there, the GIs and so forth. And uh, many of them didn't come back at all. They came back wounded physically, uh, emotionally. So, and also, uh, so Chicanos were being disproportionately drafted. There was one study that was done by Professor Ralph Guzman at Cal State LA at that time that showed that in the late 60s, uh, the Chicano population represented about 10% of the population of the Southwest, Texas to California. And yet, in terms of the casualties in Vietnam, they represented 20% of the casualties. 10% of the population then representing 20%. That was a disproportion, because, and again, it's because Donalds were disproportionately being drafted into the, to the military. Also, um, what drove the Chicano anti-war movement was that the war was siphoning off a lot of resources and programs, like in education, like in, in uh, job training and so forth. That you call this is a period of LBJ assuming the presidency after President Kennedy was tragically killed. And Johnson and LBJ has his great society program. A lot of programs are passed. Uh, Bilingual education, uh, Head Start, uh, job retraining programs. All of them did have some uh, good in, in the barrios. It did help some people. But, but, but Johnson, who had always said, we can have both guns and butter. We can have you know, of all these federal programs, but we can also pay for the war in Vietnam. Well, he couldn't have it both ways. And ultimately, he chooses the war to, to pay for. So a lot of these federal uh, Programs are cut back, and that doesn't have effect on communities like the Mexican American community. So, for those two key reasons and others, Chicanos during the period of Chicano movement mounted a, a very strong and significant Chicano anti war movement against the war in Vietnam. It was climaxed on August 29, 1970, in East Los Angeles. Uh, 20 to 30,000 predominantly Chicanos marched against the war in Vietnam. It was the largest anti-war demonstration by any minority group, including African-Americans, in the United States. Uh, and, um, and so it showed the extent of the involvement of, the, of, the, of Chicanos in the key issues of the 60s, like the, the war in Vietnam. As you know, uh, that demonstration uh, was, uh, was attacked by the LA County Sheriff's, backed up by the LAPD, uh, at the end of the rally, yeah. uh, or the end of the march, uh, 
police claimed that uh, there was some 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 of the marchers had stolen some liquor at a nearby liquor store, which was never proven. And consequently, an entire army of deputy sheriffs were already assembled. Clearly, they had an attempt to break up the, the moratorium, which was called the Chicano Anti-War Moratorium. Moratorium, as I tell my students, means stop the war or to stop. And so uh, they attacked the, the, the demonstrators in, in what's called Laguna Park. It's now been renamed Ruben Salazar Park. And they drove them out. Uh, three people were killed. Many were uh, physically attacked. Tear gas was used. Chicanos fought back, burned police cars, and so forth. And the best known victim of the breakup of the demonstration was Ruben Salazar, who I mentioned, who was uh, a, the most important Latino journalist in the United States at that time, writing for the Los Angeles Times. Mm. And Ruben had started with the Times in the early 60s wrote about the Mexican-American community, covered Vietnam, was uh, uh, bureau chief of the LA Times in Mexico City for a couple of years. And then when the movement begins, we really did the, the impact in the country, like in 67, 68, Ruben is brought back to cover the Chicano movement. And at the time of the moratorium, he was writing some very important, he became a columnist writing very important columns for the LA Times, but also he had become the news director of KMEX, at that time, the only Spanish language television station. So he was there covering the moratorium. And uh, later when the police attacked, the sheriff's attacked, he and his crew retired down Whittier Boulevard, which was the main artery of the demonstration, to a uh, bar called the Silver Dollar Cafe. Mm -hmm. uh, within a few minutes, county sheriff's police uh, Came, drove up to the cafe, to the bar, and one county sheriff shot two or three tear gas projectors, projectiles into, into the bar with an open door, just a little curtain there. One of those uh, tear gas projectors struck Ruben Salazar in the head, instantly killing him. Mm -hmm. so he becomes a victim of that day, and, um, and he becomes an almost instant martyr of the Chicano movement. First and foremost, he was a first-rate journalist. And uh, so um, the Chicano movement is very much a part of the history of that period of time. It needs to be recognized as such and needs to be integrated. I mean, the whole point of all of this kind of like the history that I've written and so forth, showing Chicanos involved in civil rights struggles, showing like that they've had leaders just take on the system <clears throat> when the system has been unjust is to hopefully teach my students, hopefully it'll trickle down to the K to 12, and that Chicanos will know that they have been a part of American history. They have contributed to this history economically, as I talked about the contributions of the Mexican American workers, but they've also forged struggles like civil rights struggles to make this a better country. And um, Sal Castro often bemoaned the fact that nothing in the schools at the time that he was teaching spoke to the Chicanos. Nothing of the history taught had anything to do with Mexican-Americans. Um, he said, how come you know, we have George Washington, Lincoln's picture? How about the picture of Benito Juarez or later Cesar Chavez? Something that tells the Chicanos that this is also their school that, and that they're part of this country. Mm -hmm. That's why all, his mantra was, Chicanos are American history. I guess my mantra is slightly revised to say, Chicano history is American history. Not something separate. Wow, I don't know what to say to that. That was amazing uh, to hear that that history and uh, you to tell it so specifically. Usually, Dr. Garcia, I do all the work on these podcasts, <laughs> but um, you know, I don't even want to talk or interrupt because uh, you you know you're just uh, so rich with all. Well, your you know that, uh, Josh. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean that. Yeah, I mean. If anything, it shows my own passion for Chicano history. But it's not a passion that is like just emotions or rhetoric. It's passion that's based on knowing what happened, the history, how Chicanos have been treated, how, how they fought back to have to be recognized as full Americans. I failed to mention that as part of that history of Chicanos being American history, 
uh, Sal Castro often often said, it's only Sal Castro's part of my mentorship. Uh, he said, you know, Chicanos, Latinos have fought in every war of the United States. He said, how many people know that? American Revolution, Spain supported the American colonists. So they, they, so people of Spanish, in this case, background, were part of the American Revolution. That's why he's saying the descendants of those Spaniards, mixed people, Chicanos, can be said to be part of the American Revolution. That the, how many people know that Chicano, Mexican Americans were involved were in the Civil War? Uh, Mexican Americans in Texas, for example, fought on the Confederate side. Mexican Americans in New Mexico, in California, fought on the Union side. How many people know that? Spanish American War. Do people know that uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders were Hispanos, Mexican Americans from New Mexico? And then, and then many thousand were in World War I including some of the immigrants who either joined or were drafted. But Mexican-Americans were uh, in World War I, and they fought very bravely, and many of them were, were decorated. And then in World War II, Josh, it's estimated that half a million people of either Mexican or Puerto Rican background, but predominantly of Mexican-American background, were in World War II. The 1940 census indicates that only about three three million Mexican-Americans in the United States. And then, so you have half a million uh, in World War II. How many people know that? Mm -hmm. They disproportionately, they fought in Europe, in North Africa, in the Pacific, in the Philippines. Uh, many were killed, many were wounded physically, emotionally, uh, as I said earlier. And disproportionately, they won more Congressional Medal of Honors, highest honor for valor in battle than any other American group. 13 Mexican-Americans won the Congressional Medal. Mm. Um, and, um, and so as Sal and, uh, and I would say, what more do people have to know that, that Chicanos are part of American history? I mean, to, to, to show that you, to prove that you're American, the ultimate is that you put your life on the line for your country. And, and they were not fighting for Mexico, they were fighting for the United States. And they were in Korea, they were in Vietnam, as we mentioned, they've been in the Gulf War, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, and yet not fully acknowledged. You know, the, the World War II veterans uh, came to be referred to as the greatest generation. Tom um, Brokaw's book on that. And yet, you read Tom Brokaw's book on the greatest generation, he doesn't have a, doesn't have a single Latino mm -hmm. based on the interviews that he did. And his stories that not a single Latino. Did the, Tom Brokaw from Los Angeles, not know that Chicanos, he, he in fact, he covered the, the anti-war moratorium. Uh, and then to add insult to injury, a few years later, Ken Burns, a great American documentarian, does his, his uh, docu documentary on World War II. Again, no Latinos. So they've been written off as part of the greatest generation, and yet they are part of the greatest generation. And when challenged by Mexican-American civil rights group, Ken Burns said, well, you know, this was not about ethnic groups, my document. Well, wait a minute, Ken. You have your requisite uh, uh, European ethnic American. You have your requisite African American. What do you mean the ethnicity wasn't part of your document? Well, he said, yeah, but uh, you know, I, I was basically uh, showing uh, how, the, how the veterans from, from four cities in the United States, how they were impacted by World War II. Well, what was one of those cities in the West, Ken? Sacrament, sac, sacrament, oh, sacrament. You couldn't find a single Mexican American veteran, veterano in Sacramento. The, the, the name of the city even calls out the fact of Mexicans in the United States. So um, that's another story I tell my students, by the way. Uh, you know, how, how people just don't realize who live in the West and so forth. Now, the names of their cities and towns and rivers and so forth all speak to the existence of a Mexican Latino presence and history and where they live. I said, you know, we've so anglicized some of these names of cities, uh, Los Angeles and Los Angeles, Santa Barbara and, and Santa Barbara, you know, but these names, I say to my students, those names didn't come with a Mayflower. Those names are the result of an earlier Spanish Mexican presence in the very areas where we live. Doesn't that tell you something? Uh, so I'm very passionate about 
you know, changing how we view American history and integrating the history of groups like Chicanos and Latinos, who unfortunately have been excluded. I mean, I really, I'm, I've never been in the military, but, uh, and I could tell you of my own Vietnam <laughs> War story, but, but, but I mean, come on, if, if nothing else, integrate these veterans into things like the greatest generation. They fought for this country. They laid their lives down for this country. Then they came back and were still treated as inferior Mexicans. There was one story of one Congressional Medal of Honor winner in South Texas who came back. And, and even with his uniform, was not allowed entry into a restaurant in, in South Texas. Can you believe that? Uh, so there's, we've got a lot of things to change for nothing the reason that our kids in the schools, many of them who are now Chicanos and Mexican Americans, like they need to know very much uh, to to that they're part of this, this country. South Castro again would say, if if the kids don't aren't the kids aren't don't know about their history, uh, feel that their culture has been treated inferiorly, they're going to see themselves in an inferior way, and and it's a recipe for. Uh, Lack of a fit. It's a recipe for failure. Mm -hmm. it, it's 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 psychology one hundred and one. So I would say that to be successful, you have to feel good about yourself. You have to feel good about yourself. These kids, these kids are not made have historically not been made to feel good about themselves in the school. That needs to change. Mm -hmm. They need to feel good about themselves. But I still get kids, you know, so Josh, that come to my classes. They don't even know who Cesar Chavez was. They <laughs> yeah. don't. And uh, I'll tell you a little anecdote on that. So when Cesar Chavez died in 1993, great leader of the farm workers, major American figure, probably the best known Latino historical figure in the United States and in the world, I guess. So uh, Cesar died in 1993. And one of my colleagues in his class told the class, uh, this is very tragic because we just learned that Cesar Chavez had, has passed, and it's a very tragic uh, day for that. And one of the students said, "Oh yeah, it's really, it's really tragic. He was such a good boxer. Oh. He meant Julio Cesar, Julio. Chavez, <laughs> who was a good boxer, yeah. but not the Cesar Chavez, <laughs> Cesar Chavez. So this is, you know, we have produced so much I, history, and I've, I've, I've contributed to that." I may say so, that's what's being acknowledged on the second day of the conference and all the books that I've done and so forth and so on that cover the whole span of, I cover 19th century, the early Mexican immigrants, I cover the Mexican American generation, I cover the Chicano generation. I even wrote a book a few years later called The Latino Generation about, or my students, uh, the millennials, I, I call them the Latino generation, and I interviewed a number of them, published it in a book. But, um, but uh, they don't. They don't. They don't know know much of this history. The student. They, we have produced so much knowledge, Josh. Then when I first started Chicano history teaching in 1969, and now 50 some odd years later, we have so much that has been produced. However, it has not unfortunately steeped down to the K to 12. Yeah. That's why this kid thought that Cesar Chavez was the boxer, yeah. not the great farm work civil rights and farm worker leader. Yeah. I don't understand that, Josh, because we now have more Chicano Latino teachers in our public schools, certainly California. We have those who are principals, vice principals, counselors, even people who serve on school boards now. Why isn't the curriculum significantly changed so that these kids are aware of the significant historical contributions of people who look like themselves. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's a shame. Uh, and it's because, again, the referee to South Castro, he said, it does us no good to have this kind of ethnic transformations in our schools, for example, in terms of the teachers being more Mexican Americans, Latino. So if they're not going to be change makers, in other words, if they're not going to take on the system and say, hey, no, we've got to change that curriculum. Even though we have to take on my own principal or the school, things have to change here, just like Sal did, trying to get change in 68, teaching his kids. 
Uh, they got to be change makers. And the same thing goes with our politicians. They can't just can't go to Sacramento, Washington, and uh, just kind of uh, accept the status quo or just, just become part of, you know, regular type of politicians. And as you know, some of the stories of Mexican American Latino politicians recently being involved in corruption or various other kinds of things, you know, and uh, that's that's not unacceptable. They've got to be change makers and, and change the system. And uh, that's what I think the population wants. That's what our kids deserve. Wow. Well, Dr. Garcia, you truly are a, a change maker. You know, you are what you want from others. You are that in academia and your work will live on. And the great thing about your books and your history is that every generation coming forward is going to be able to benefit from that research and that work. And you really special because if you didn't do that, it wouldn't have been done. I mean, there are others that you had mentioned, obviously in your, that came out of that Chicano uh, civil rights movement. But um, if you removed you from that, no one else would have done the work that you've done. And I think that's the mark of somebody who's a real, um, uh, historic figure and somebody who's a real uh, contributor to our society because if a hundred people are doing something and you're also doing it that's one thing but if you're one of one doing something that is what is remarkable about your contributions and well you're, you're way too kind Josh but thank <laughs> you so much for saying and so 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 with that let's wrap up and just you know again the the, the sixth annual biannual uh, Sal Castro Memorial Conference, which is coming up, uh, and also a day honoring you and your work and your history is really, this is February 17th and 18th at UCSB, free, by the way, which is amazing, free and open to the public. It's at, in, in our uh, Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, which is in the Humanities and Social Science Building on campus. Yeah. So uh, thank you for, for, for doing that. And I look forward to uh, learning more on those days. And uh, thank you for taking time today to share your story, a little bit of your story. And I can just imagine the students who had the opportunity to take you, how wonderful those classes must have been. So uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Mario Garcia. Have a great day. Thank you, Josh, very much. Thank you so much. Sure.